Well, good morning again. Good morning again. If I could have your attention. So good to be here. So excited for this morning. How's everyone doing? It feels like a wonderful energy in the room. God is present among us. And um, yeah, we're in for a really exciting morning this morning. Um, For those of you that don't know me, my name is Josh. I have the privilege of being on staff here at the church, one of the pastors here, and so thrilled to be sharing for a few moments. We are coming to land today on our vision series. It's just been a phenomenal couple of weeks, and I'd really encourage you, if you've missed any of the last two weeks, head to our website, holvinia.co.uk, and please do catch up. It's been brilliant, and we're in for a bit of a treat this morning because um, we are mixing things up. Are you excited about that? So uh, you're going to be hearing from a a few of us that are going to be sharing this morning. I'm going to be sharing for about 15 minutes um, in theory. And then (laughs) Joni is going to be coming to share. uh, And then John will kind of wrap it all up and bring it to land. Uh, So it's a bit of a different morning. And just thought it would be wonderful just to hear from a few different people really as we... um, as we come into land on the vision series. And so what I want to do is just kind of remind ourselves of where we are with a particular focus on the Hope Center. So if you have missed the last couple of weeks, uh, this first bit is going to be really helpful. And then I'm going to tell some stories of what God is doing. And uh, I've got some stunning stories of uh, what he's up to. And then there'll be um, just a short time at the end where I'll just share a little bit of a sense of what I, I kind of feel like God is doing and uh, um, uh, something, I think, profound that happened to me recently. So that's what's going to happen. Then I'm going to hand over to Joni. So um, the Hope Center. Let me just get us up to speed and remind ourselves where we find ourselves. The centerpiece, really, of our, of our vision over the last couple of weeks has been the Hope Center. So the Hope Center, if you don't know, will be a brand new building built on our current site as a gift to the city. Are you excited about that? It's going to be incredible. It will be a home of compassion for Hull and beyond. It will be a place of belonging and hospitality, a place of healing and freedom. It will house all of our current compassion initiatives and provide lots of room to grow. It will enable us to expand hugely and develop new opportunities to welcome our city home. It will include a warehouse a beautiful cafe, a laundrette and showers, a supermarket. It will include a grow baby boutique shop, a catering kitchen, office spaces, an a, a expanded office for community money advice debt center, a clothes shop and more. It will host job clubs, language courses, youth meetings, meals for our homeless friends, counseling spaces, prayer ministry, prayer meetings and much more. It will increase our work with refugees, with resourcing other churches, and bring significant multiplication to all that we are currently doing. It is an exciting time in the life of our church. And this goes beyond a social action project. This is a tangible, located space where heaven can invade earth, where the lost can find home, where the disillusion can discover hope where the poor can receive support, where the chains of injustice will be broken and and systems of injustice dismantled, where the hungry can get fed and the lonely welcomed into family. That is what we are doing, and it is really simply our next yes to the Lord, our next step of obedience to him, and everyone is invited. You are all You are all on the balcony tuning in online. You are all invited to be part of this incredible story of what God is doing. If you've got a Bible, simply um, quickly just turn to Acts chapter 2. I want to read a few verses from uh, the beginning of the story of the early church. The words will come up on the screen. This is what it says, verse 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together, and they had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. So this is the early church. This is the blueprint. This is the church as they get filled with the Holy Spirit, sent out on mission into the world. This is what this community, radical community of Jesus followers looks like. This is the DNA, the blueprint of what it means to follow Jesus. 
And alongside prayer, and alongside studying the Bible, and doing life together in community, and alongside expecting miracles to be happening as a regular thing, expecting supernatural lives, did you notice that the remarkable, radical, open-handed generosity marked the early church? This was a normal part of the Christian life. Notice what it said, they sold property and possessions to give to those in need. This was part of the early church. They were just, nothing is our own. Everything belongs to Jesus. And we want to make sure we give everything we have in order to bless and love those that are struggling. And it was the generosity which changed the lives of others. This is our heart as a church. To be a house whose generosity rewrites people's stories and brings hope to the city. And the Hope Center is a gift to our city. But how many of you know that everything worthwhile costs? So we believe an appropriate estimate to shoot for, to raise towards the building is 750000 And John has unpacked a little bit of this over the last couple of weeks. But we are essentially asking us as the church, as we seek to follow Jesus, to stand in the gap for this. To give financially, to ask how we can play our parts, and to pray. And so next Sunday is going to be, I believe, a significant moment in the life of our church. It is Giving Sunday. I believe it's a day which will go down in history as we step out with faith and generosity. It will be a powerful moment in the life of our community where everyone from the very youngest to the very oldest will have an opportunity to sow into the Hope Center, where parents get to model to their kids generosity and encourage their kids to join in on the story where students counterculturally give to play their part in something better, where those with lots and those with little can join together in unity to give what they feel the Lord is calling them to give. And as John said over the last couple of weeks, it's not about equal amounts, but about equal sacrifice. And I believe the sacrifice that happens on next week and in the coming weeks and months will release a future over our city which will bring life and be a huge blessing. It's going to be amazing. It's going to be awesome. We're going to get all the kids in. It's going to be chaos. It's going to be fun. It's going to be brilliant. We're going to be worshipping and putting our pledges. We've got some beautiful big baskets, which are going to be at the front, and uh, it's going to be a powerful, powerful moment. Um, One of my favorite films is the film Gladiator. And in the words of Maximus Decimus Meridius... He said, what we do in moments like this will echo into eternity. (laughs) Sorry, that was a bit of a curveball. I regret putting that in there. So next Sunday, guys, at both the 10 a.m. and the 6 p.m., we're going to be joining together for a monumental step of faith. And I'd encourage you to begin by praying. Ask God how much he would have you give. You can give an upfront gift uh, and and or a pledge over 18 months, and next Sunday will be a celebration. So come ready. You'll notice there are pledge cards on your chairs. Take one, pray over it, bring it back filled in. But if you, if you, even if you forget it next week, we'll have loads available uh, next Sunday. And if you've kind of missed this, we've got loads of these brilliant brochures which cast a great vision for the Hope Center. I fill in a few of the details as well for that. So that would be wonderful. Are you excited? Are you ready? It's going to be life-changing and city-changing, I believe, significantly. So let me just tell, I'd love to share a few stories. Now, I love stories, and one of the reasons I love stories um, is because stories are powerful. Because stories indicate what God is doing and where God is moving. And when we gather stories, and I have the privilege of hearing lots of stories in my role in the church, we gather these stories, we can begin to see a bit of a picture and a pattern. We can kind of perceive where God is moving and the things that God seems to be moving on so that we can simply say yes and press in where God is moving. Steve Nicholson, who um, is kind of a hero in the vineyard, he came to our church about six weeks ago. He said this line which struck me so powerfully. He said, stop inviting God to do what you want him to do. Ask God what he's doing and join him with that. It's a good, good, just great wisdom. And so we're trying to pay attention to some of the stories that are coming out and stories that we're hearing. And actually, they seem to be falling into three categories. And I think these three categories um, represent what God is doing among us now and 
what the Hope Center will represent. The, the three categories that we seem to be seeing God moving in is supernatural breakthrough, healings, deliverances, amazing God moments and God incidences. Secondly, stories of radical compassion and generosity. And thirdly, stories of salvation and multiplication. Now, I've got a few stories that I'm going to be sharing with you. Are you okay? Are you ready for some stories? And it's going to encourage your heart this morning. So over the last few weeks and months, we are seeing an increase in healings. I'm going to tell you two stories. Actually, I'm going to get a guy up. I just heard this story this morning. So just in a moment, Eddie, come up. But here's a story that happened a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we had a word of knowledge at the front for someone whose right ear was infected. And right ear was in a lot of pain. And uh, we sensed that Jesus wanted to bring healing a guy comes forward to the front and gets prayer and sends me this text at 3 p.m. that afternoon. Bro, it starts. Big fan of text to begin with that. Thanks for the word about the ear today. That was for me. You won't believe what came out of my ear when I got back home. Sick emoji. He goes on to say this, the full story is that I went to the GP the week before last for tonsillitis and the GP checked my ears as well and told me the right one was totally blocked and probably had been for some time. She prescribed olive oil, which I'm not sure has done anything since then. Stu prayed for me today and I felt pressure and my ear popped. I got home, used the cotton bud and the whole blockage came out. Praise God. Completely healed. Isn't that awesome? So good. Now, where's Eddie. Eddie, come on. Come on up, bro. Uh, let's give Eddie a round of applause. Just look at that. Eddie, uh, just tell us, uh, step into the light. Should be on. I can shout. There we go. <laughs> Eddie, tell us what happened to you last week. It wasn't last week, it was oh. two weeks ago. Two weeks ago. Two weeks Sorry. ago. Get your facts right, Josh. All the other week, uh, four nights ago, it was, I was in absolute agony. I couldn't even put my shoe on. I couldn't lift my foot over, up about an inch. Mally will tell you, it was absolute excruciating pain. I don't know whether I trapped a nerve, uh, a tendon, or whatever it is, but I couldn't lift my leg. I could stand on it, it didn't hurt. As soon as I tried to lift it, it was agony. Getting in the car was murder. Getting up at three or four times a night to go, well, too much information, really. <laughs> too much information, but you know what it's like. I'm just glad that I, I'd lived in a bungalow because climbing up the stairs would have been murder. But the worst thing was, on my motorbike. You know how I like my motorbike. Getting on that, I couldn't, I couldn't start it. I couldn't lift my leg up. Then, so I had to put it in gear with this thing, then try and lift my leg up as I'm driving. And I found a zip there, so I grabbed all the zip. We cut the live stream, I feel like. And I'm, I'm trying to lift it. Honestly, incriminating evidence. it was agony. Jeff, you was there, weren't you? We, was, we went for a motorbike ride, and I was in agony. Well, I came on, on the Sunday, still the same, and Josh said, there's somebody with a hip problem. I was the first out. I was, I was the first out. And Andy came up and prayed with me. And do you know, I felt it go immediately. Wow. I couldn't have done that, I couldn't have put my shoes on. And awesome. not come back, not felt a twinge ever since. It's, the Lord's good, isn't it? Praise the Lord. But he does ask us to, to get others to pray because, because You're it's the body into my ministry, time, isn't it? The Lord bless you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Give a round of applause. <laughs> Stunning. All right. Let me, just, let me just move through some more stories. Uh, compassion. So we're seeing healings and God is we're expecting that God uh, is going to continue to do that. In the area of compassion, we are seeing continued increase in favor and partnerships. Just a couple of weeks ago, we gave just under a thousand pounds of brand new clothes and shoes to refugees that we've established a relationship with in partnership with another local church. Um, these guys kind of moved over from Iraq and Syria and various other places into a hotel in North Ferriby, and we are blessing them. And so that has been amazing. 
seeing significant partnerships springing up, and that is our heart, as you know. I heard last week that Whole Truck Theatre are doing a play, a performance of a play called Mumsy, about parenting and life and struggles of that, and they are highlighting the incredible work that Grow Baby is doing as part of the performance. Isn't that awesome? And they've encouraged everyone who comes to the play on the day it's running to bring something to donate to Grow Baby. Wow. That's awesome. Yeah, you can round of applause that. And then finally, just a couple of stories about multiplication and salvation. We are seeing God do some just remarkable things all across the church, many ministries, uh, particularly in the area of kind of young families and um, Grow Baby is doing significant things. Stay and play. I think uh, last week or the week before last had 105 people, uh, like a parents, guardians, toddler group. 105. It's carnage. <laughs> it's amazing. And so we are seeing significant um, uh, multiplication. And just a story I'd love to share. Um, I, I've kind of shared a little bit of this story before, but um, it kind of came together on at the last stay and play. Hannah, my wife, came to me and said, Josh, our midwife is here at church at stay and play. And uh, we, we went down and um, had a chat, and we, we heard the story from this midwife. And uh, I'd kind of heard it second or third hand. It's powerful to hear it in person. But when our daughter was born, Ivy, two and a half years ago, we, our, our highest priority in that room was the presence of God. We, we had our own, we're blessed to have our own kind of suite in the birthing pool. And we had worship music on, and we just needed the presence of God in those moments, which are, um, many of you will know, just, I mean, it's complicated. Birth is, is a, I don't know how to describe it. It's indescribable, but uh, yeah, we, you need the presence of God. And so we worshiped lots, we prayed lots, and our two midwives in the room were not from a church background. They were not part of a church. Um, and, but there was some, it was a beautiful experience and we invited our midwife to church and both of them and um, kind of didn't really hear anything back anyway on Sunday uh, last Wednesday uh, we spoke to our midwife and she told her this story she said the day I have never forgot the day you guys gave well my wife gave birth to Ivy I was present not not in that way and um, she said, I've never forgotten it. And there was another birth of a sister of someone who comes to this church, which was, I think, uh, equally powerful in the story. She said, I've never forgotten your story. And God used it in my life. Since then, I have been baptized in my local church. Since then, my husband, who would have never have come to church ever, has become a Christian. He's being baptized on Easter Sunday this year. And his mum is, I think, become a Christian as well. And she is just stunning. Whole household's coming to faith. And she was like, that moment when you're in, your, in, in that birthing room, just pressing into the presence of God in a moment of like, we need Jesus, has had an eternal impact. And so it's so profound and life-changing. And I want to encourage you guys, whatever you're doing, Jesus wants to use that to reach people. Every moment you find yourselves in. Isn't that awesome? Okay, finally, um, I want to just share a little bit of a, a sense of what God's doing. I'm sorry, I'm running out, of, running over time. Um, a couple of weeks ago, uh, John Journey were on holiday, and uh, the, I felt like the Lord gave me a, a dream. And I, I've probably had two or three significant God dreams, and this was one of them. The first one was at university in my first year, and it kind of propelled me into ministry, and this was another one. And it, it, God kind of spoke to me from the Bible, John chapter 21. And what happened um, was God like read me the passage in the dream and began to show me things in the dream about this passage in John 21. And the story is with Jesus, uh, Peter and his disciples are uh, fishing. Remember this story? And um, they fish all night long, and they don't catch anything. And the next morning, they must be exhausted. Jesus, who they don't really recognize at that point, stands on the shore and says to the disciples, have you caught anything? And they said, no, we've not. He said, cast your nets over to the other side of the boat. And then they catch a, a, a fish, uh, catch a fish bigger than they could have possibly imagined. And um, in my dream, God showed me this passage, he began, and he began to speak to me, and he said this. In the dream, he said, most people are aware of the obvious miracle, which is the miraculous catch of fish. 
But he said, Josh, I want you to see there was another miracle that happened, and it was the fact that they fished all night and caught nothing. They fished all night and caught nothing. The fish were there in the lake. That nighttime was the right time to catch, and yet felt like God saying, my hand held the fish back. There were two miracles that happened. And I really felt like God spoke to me in that story. And he said there were two seasons that God was inviting us into as a church, represented by a nighttime pursuit and the daytime catch. And the nighttime pursuit of the fish spoke of a posture of hunger for the Lord, of waiting on the Lord, of pressing in, of seeking his face, of pursuing his presence, of prayer, of longing, of waiting, of tarrying. And we're seeing this, aren't we? An increased awareness of God amongst us in our meetings, an increased pressing into the things of God. Our prayer meetings are only increasing in intensity. In fact, this coming Monday, tomorrow, we are going to be hosting our main prayer meeting, 7.30, here at church in the main auditorium. As a simple step of faith that God is going to multiply what he's doing. So that was what the nighttime represented. We're creating space for that. But as we do that, my sense is that we'll see a daytime season where in response to his voice, our nets will become so full we won't know what to do. And I felt like God was showing me this in the dream. He was saying it's not an either or, an either or it's a both and. It is waiting on him and going for the lost. It's prayer for his kingdom to come, and it's a pursuit of those that don't know Jesus. It's his presence here and now, and it's his presence out there on the streets. So that is everything from me. Um, can we welcome Joni up to share her heart? Good morning, everybody. So good to see you. It's been forever since I've been up in that sort of things, I think. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah. Uh, if you don't know me, my name is Joni. Along with my husband, John, we have the great privilege of leading this church. And um, this morning, I get the privilege of sharing a bit of my heart with you guys um, as we enter into this new phase of, um, yeah, building. So, the Hope Center. When I started to think and pray about, you know, what God might have wanted me to say, I was just reminded of the story of the miracle of multiplication with the five loaves and two fish. It's probably one of the most well-known miracles. And in this story, Jesus had been teaching the multitudes, and they were hungry. It was a remote area, and it was late in the day. And the topic came up of, well, what are we going to do about this? <laughs> They're already hungry. How are we going to fix this? And Jesus responded, so the question Jesus posed to the disciples was, how many loaves do you have? Just check it out. How many do you have? So they gathered all that they could, and Jesus thanked God for it and gave it to the disciples to distribute. And then they found, as it happens, they had two fish as well. So the same thing happened. Jesus thanked God for it, and he gave it to the disciples to distribute that as well. So when they had all done that, everyone had eaten, and they'd all had their fill. Jesus said, well, hang on a minute. Just collect all the leftovers. Let nothing be wasted. And there were 12 basketfuls of scraps, basically, leftovers. Now, I've always wondered whatever happened to those 12 baskets, but that's for another day. Anyhow, so the number of people who got to eat that day was 5,000. But that was just the men. Of course, they fed the women and the children as well. And um, they didn't just usually have one or two kids back then. So I think it's pretty safe to assume that probably about maybe 10 to 15,000 people ate that day on five loaves and two fish. Because it was never about the number of loaves of bread and fish. And in Luke's gospel, Jesus tells the disciples, you give them something to eat. You see, the disciples had it in their mind that they're just going to send the crowds out. Go sort yourselves out, and then we'll sort it out after, we'll come talk after. But, you know, Jesus' plan was actually, disciples, you're going to be the ones to help. So you help, you give. Now, we are at capacity, if you haven't noticed, in so many areas of our church life. And just as in your home, in the natural, with your homes at your, where you actually live, we, you know, when you get to a capacity level, you, you do face a choice. So are we going to move, get to a bigger house, or are we going to get creative with what we've already got? Now, I don't know about you, but John and I secretly love the feel. Phil and Christie's Love It or List It is the TV program. And, you know, with this house and with this home, we feel that the Lord has said that we're going to love it. We're not going to list it. And so we're going to build the extension. 
And it's going to be an extension of his love, an extension of his grace and of dignity and of hope to this city and beyond. And I feel like the Lord is asking us to seek him, not your bank manager, with what he would have you give, what he would have you suggest, maybe what, what could you do without, maybe what could you sacrifice. And, you know, I don't know, maybe this is a good time right now for you to kind of reevaluate your finances, look at your budgets again, and maybe reevaluate the priorities and prayerfully choose where you actually spend your money. And again, the leaders go first. That's just an expectation. And it's definitely something that John and I are actively doing right now in our own personal finances. So my personal question for me, my own challenge to myself, is not, what could I do with giving? Lord, what are you saying? What could I do with giving? But actually, I felt like he was saying, what could I do without in order to be able to give. And I find myself reflecting on all that God has done in and through Hall Vineyard. Um, when this was just a small church plant, the prayers, the hopes and dreams of all the people, they hadn't yet come into fruition. And that was way before my time. And I'm so thankful for that. But you know, that we would have hundreds and hundreds of people coming to meet with Jesus each week was just a dream that would yet to be realized. And, you know, we want to dare to dream dreams that are far beyond the limitations of our lifetime. Some of the little ones around now will be able to look back and say, oh, I remember when that was being built. Um, they'll be able to look back, just as we've done with our previous buildings where we've been, at the Hope Center. We are building our legacy here. And I think about the Hope Center and I get excited. It's just brimming with possibilities and just knowing that it will only continue and keep growing. This will be a grace outpost with rooms to meet even more needs of the people of this city and beyond. Rooms to facilitate growth so that as we continue to grow, we can accommodate people with excellence so that they can too come to meet Jesus. How nice is our new cafe? Like, it's just such a blessing to be able to say to a friend, hey, come, have a coffee with me. And just, you know, being really confident that they will receive a warm welcome with a fantastic cafe where they can, we can comfortably meet up. And it's a great cup of coffee. And I'm just so proud that this is my church. This is my family. And this is our home. So the time is now. This isn't some far off dream and the next 18 months, although it sounds like a lot, will go by so quickly. And you know what an honor it is personally to be able to be part of something that will serve our city and beyond and to give them opportunities that they have never been given. To stand with them as God rewrites generational stories of hope and of dignity. You know, many times throughout the Bible, Jesus was moved to compassion which resulted in behavior. So he was moved by compassion to change the circumstance for people. We have this opportunity to be moved by compassion, to go and be the hands and the feet of Jesus to the city where we have found ourselves. Our remit is right here. It's right where we are. It's not some far off land. This is our patch. And oftentimes, society looks around the world, particularly amongst unrest and security and hard times and disaster, and they ask, where's the church? Aren't they supposed to help? And I just think that now is our time. This is our call to give of ourselves and to change the perception of who the church is, of what we do, and of what we are known for far too long, the church have been infamous for what they've gotten so terribly wrong. And this is our chance to show who God has actually called us to be. A faithful church, dependable, loving, generous, a place of hope. We have been entrusted with talents and we don't want to be found wanting. You know, one day we face Jesus and he says, hey, I gave you the opportunity to expand, to love radically to grow, to share my hope. What do you do with it? And I, I want to be able to stand before him and say, I stewarded it really well. You gave me five loaves and two fish, and I got out of my own way, and I let you have your way. And just look, look what you did. Look how you grew it. God is looking for willing hearts. That's what he's here for. He's, he's, he's entirely unconcerned with the number of loaves of bread and fish. We bring what we have. 
and he multiplies. It is not about the number. He alone is the Lord of the harvest. Thank you. So now John's going to come and speak. Well, I just want to spend a couple of minutes just wrapping things up and then we're going to get in some, some prayer. Um, that was so good. And, and, and I was, what we're doing with this vision series and at the moment is the, picture I, the best picture I can give you is, is um, you're doing a jigsaw puzzle. Who here likes doing jigsaw puzzles? Well, more than I thought. Maybe we should have a ministry in the life of the church. A jigsaw small group. Anyway, that wasn't on my notes. Um, it's just me being prophetic. And, and so imagine you've got a, a complicated jigsaw puzzle and the pieces are just poured out on the table. And it's kind of like we're, we've got a piece and we're just in the kind of the bottom corner and we're just depending on the next step and the next uh, piece to, to place. And we're trying some things out and some things don't fit. And, but it is, it's kind of like a, a journey of trust and dependence and faith. That's how Christianity works. The word of God is a, a lamp unto our feet before it's a light unto our path. We'd much prefer it to be a light unto our path so we could work out where we're going. But it doesn't work like that. It's one step at a time. It's left foot, right foot, left foot, right foot. Just allowing the lamp of his word and the lamp of his voice to guide us. And we're just placing the pieces of this puzzle. God sees the box lid. He sees the final picture. It's all in his hands. He's the sovereign God. He is the Lord of the harvest. And yet he's calling us, his church, just to build. Build the church one step at a time. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. And so as we're building, we're listening and we're leaning in and we're saying, Lord, speak and... Josh shared with me that dream and I went to that text in John 21. I felt like it was such a crucial word for us that I wanted to just um, reiterate a little bit what Josh said, but maybe from a different angle. And I think the principle of this passage is really important and crucial for us in this next season. Here are these disciples who... Um, went out together an inconvenient time at night to fish and they don't catch anything. And then they listen to an instruction. They listen to a word and they change strategy. And the nets go at the other side of the boat and lo and behold, they catch so much fish that they can't contain it. So they go from nothing to everything based on an instruction. And it's interesting, after they do that and they obey the word, something happens. It says that they recognized Jesus and they said that it is the Lord. Mission, and we shared our heart last week in terms of mission, in terms of a culture of mission and life for the church, seeing people regularly come to faith, healed, set free. The extension of mission and our heart that we're building with the Hope Center will only come in extraordinary ways when we recognize the voice of Jesus and recognize him as Lord. If we go and build the Hope Center and do mission without first recognizing him, we will fail. We won't catch anything. It is a journey of trust and faith where the Lord is inviting us to do it together. And I know often we want to do things on our own strength and control things, but the Lord is inviting us to do this together. And so the invitation for us as a church is to lean into Jesus like never before, to lean into his word, to love and hunger after his presence and then we will see the harvest, to seek him in prayer, to seek him in his word, to see him like Isaiah did, to recognize him like the disciples 
did, to gaze upon him, to sit with him, to eat with him, to obey him, to love him, then we will see the harvest. And this is how it's always been biblically. The discipleship and mission are inextricably linked. It's not either or, it is both and. Worship and compassion are inextricably linked. It's difficult to worship God, give him your everything, and not go out in compassion. But people who long for the kingdom to come in compassion and justice and beauty, and we're seeing this even with people outside the church, the reality is is we must have the kingdom, but with the king. Not just the kingdom. And our invitation, our joy, as a church, from the King of Kings, is to love on him, to see him, to worship him, to be with him, and then we will see his kingdom come in incredible power. So this is what, to summarize the last three weeks, and yes, we're talking about the Hope Center, but it's God is whispering to us, wooing us to come to a place of a revival of love for Jesus, to be a Jesus people, a Jesus movement. And out of that revival of love for him, we can see a revival in our communities. So why do you stand?